بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing our journey through عمدة الفقه في إمام ابن القدام المقدسي رحمه الله تعالى. Sometimes we have favors of Allah subhanahu wa taala upon us, and we don't really understand how great they are. But upon reflection and pondering, they become clearer and clearer as to how great the bounty of Allah Azawajal is upon us. Now imagine the view from far up, close to the heavens, looking down upon the earth. Throughout the earth you see darkness, you see pollution, pollution of sins, pollution of disobedience, pollution of that one sin that Allah Azawajal doesn't forgive, which is shirk, to associate partners besides Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. To say that Allah has a father or a son or a mother, to ascribe anything to Allah Azawajal, which is not befitting to him. And to imagine that much of the world at this moment is celebrating that or involved in that. But yet, at the same time looking down upon the earth, you see pockets of bright lights. You see pockets of fresh air, wherein people have gathered. Gathered for what purpose? No other purpose except to remember their Lord and to remember the favors of their Lord upon them, and to extol the virtues of their Lord, and to learn about their Lord and how to worship their Lord. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَا جَلَسَ قَوْمْ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ سَكِينَةً وَغَشْيَتُمُ الرَّحْمَةً وَحَفَّتُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةً وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهُمْ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No people sit together in a gathering remembering Allah Azawajal, except that mercy envelopes them. Tranquility descends upon them and the angels they gather upon them in that gathering and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers them in a gathering which is greater than the gathering wherein they were remembering him. So when you think of it in that manner that subhanallah, billions of people, millions of people are disobeying Allah but he chose me. He looked upon me with that favor and that blessing that I could come to the masjid. I could come to one of the houses from the houses of Allah azza wa jal. And I could be from those few that remember him and that spend my time learning about him. When you think of it in that manner, then you realize how great this bounty is upon us. We could have easily been out there from those who are neglectful, from those who are oblivious to that which is real sweetness in life. The real sweetness is here. The real sweetness is in the places where Allah is being worshipped, in the places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being remembered in doing any type of deed which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that way, we should always remember that we are not doing a favor to Allah by coming to the masjid. Allah has blessed us. The favor is upon us from Allah azza wa jal. And we are the ones who have so much to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. In any case, continuing with the chapter that we started last week, the chapter of wudu. So the imam, after giving us the description of the wudu, he now goes further and he breaks down uh, the wudu into the obligatory acts and the sunnah acts, the supererogatory acts, the recommended acts, okay? So first of all, he says, وَالْوَاجِبَاتُ min dalik." The wajibat, the oblig obligatory acts from that, okay? So what he's doing here, as I said, he's mentioned the obligatory acts, but there's a bit of confusion here. Because the first thing that Imam, he says, he says, niya. The first of them is the niya, intention, that you intend what act of worship you are doing, and you intend who you are doing it for. So it has to be for Allah Azawajal, and you distinguish in your heart what act of worship you are doing, okay? So the niya, here, he's put it down as wajib, which means obligatory, but it's not wajib, the niya is a shart. Shart, from the shurut of wudu. Shart means condition, okay? So we have different terms in Islamic um, jurisprudence. So we took many of them. Wajib, we said, is that if you do it, you are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you do not do it, you are liable to be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something which is obligatory. So the Imam is talking about the wajibat, those which are obligatory actions in the wudu. But the first thing that he mentions, an niya, the reality of this act of worship, the intention, is that it's a condition for all acts of worship. Okay? So I'm going to define for you now what does a condition mean technically in Islamic jurisprudence. What does it mean? Uh, Al-Shart, it means, uh, Al-Shart, they define it as, ma yalzimu min adamihi al-adam. That 
which if it is absent, then it necessitates that the act of worship will be absent. مَا يَلْزِمُ مِنْ عَدْمِهِ الْعَدْمِ That if it is found to be absent, it necessitates that the act of worship will be absent. Meaning that the intention, if it's absent, there's no way you can have an act of worship. You have to have an intention, right? Like the wudu. Wudu is a condition for prayer. If wudu is absent, there's no way you can have the prayer. So that which necessitates from its absence, absence. If the thing is absent, the condition is absent, then the act of worship is going to be absent. So that's the first part of the definition. مَا يَلْزِمُ مِنْ عَدَمِهِ الْعَدَمِ وَلَا يَلْزِمُ مِنْ وُجُودِهِ وجود ولا عدم. And the second part is it doesn't necessitate that if that condition is found, that the act of worship would be found or not found. If the, if the condition is there, it doesn't necessitate that the act of worship will be there or not there. Again, wudu for example. Somebody, has, somebody uh, makes wudu, but it doesn't necessitate that they will go ahead and pray. Nor does it necessitate that they won't go ahead and pray. And pray okay? So this is the definition of the word condition. So with regards to other conditions for wudu, the first of them we said is niya. The imam, he doesn't mention this because this is a beginner's level book which is beneficial for all of us, but I'll give you a bit more information. So the other conditions that are required for wudu is Islam. First and foremost, you must be a Muslim. Without being a Muslim, without submitting and acknowledging that Allah is your Lord to be worshipped alone without any partners and that Muhammad is his final messenger, no matter what act of worship you do, you won't be rewarded for it in the hereafter. You may get some reward in this world, but not in the hereafter, okay? So the first thing is Islam. The second is a tamiz, okay? Actually, before, before tamiz is aql. Aql is intelligence. If the person is absent of intelligence, whereby he has some type of insanity, then this person lifted from him is the uh, obligation of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these ways, okay? Because the person can't think straight. The third of them is tamiz. Tamiz means that the person can distinguish between right and wrong and he can understand instructions, okay? Reaches an age of seven and above where the person can generally understand instructions. So if the person is a Muslim, he has aql or she has aql, and they reach the age of tamiz, then many of the acts of worship become obligatory upon this person. Also from the conditions is Qudra. Qudra means ability. If you don't have the ability, Allah doesn't obligate you with the action. If you cannot use water due to the fact you have some skin problem, Allah is not going to insist upon you and cause you to harm yourself by using water. There are other things you can do to purify yourself like tayammam. Okay? Qudra. Also from the conditions of wudu is inqita' al-mujib. They say al-mujib, which means the cutting off of that which causes you to require wudu, like going to the bathroom. Okay, that has to finish and be stopped. Okay, from them also they say tuhuriyatul ma, the purity of water, tuhuriyatul ma wa ibahatuhu, the purity of water and um, it's legal nature, meaning that it's not stolen. It's legal for you to use. You have permission to use the water. Because if you make uh, wudu from stolen water, it's not your property. Your, your wudu is not going to be accepted. Okay? Uh, and removing that which prevents the water from reaching your skin. Why is this a condition? You've been ordered by Allah in the ayat of wudu to wash yourself, right, on these particular limbs. But if you have something like some type of henna or some paint which is preventing the water to reach your skin, then that has to be removed, okay? If it's not removed, then it means that your uh, limbs have not been washed, okay? But if it's something which is extremely difficult to remove, then the sharia gives you ease. The sharia overlooks that. Because really when you study the sharia, you find that many of the laws of Allah is based upon ease. So though Allah is telling you remove anything which prevents the water from reaching your skin, if it's something which is difficult to remove, that's overlooked. Okay? Like for example, some types of paint. Well, istijmar. And the last of them is istijmar. And we mentioned this before in the chapter of how to go to the bathroom, etc. Istijmar. So these are some of the conditions 
which pertain to wudu. And you can go back to the video to review them and revise them, inshallah. So the Imam, he says, the first of the obligatory actions is the niyyah, the intention. And we said that rather this is a condition, okay? The next of them, the Imam, he mentions, he said, وَالْغُسَلْ marra marra," And to wash the body parts one time. Okay, to wash the body parts one time. So washing them more than one time is that which is recommended, which is sunnah. How many times should you wash your body parts? Huh? Three times, except for which part do you do not wash three times? The head. The head you wipe once only, okay? So it's sunnah recommended on the way of the Prophet ﷺ to wash three times. But obligatory is one time. Now, Ali radiallahu anhu, he mentions as collected by Imam Ahmad, Imam Nisa'i, Imam Khuzayma and others, that he once, Ali radiallahu anhu, made wudu. And what he did when making wudu, he wiped his body parts. All of his body parts, he didn't wash them. He wiped them. He said, هَذَا wudu مَنْ لَمْ يُحْدِثْ وَرَأَيْتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم هَكَذَا فَعَلْ He said, this is the wudu of the one that didn't break his wudu. So it's known as tajdeed al-wudu. To renew your wudu for every prayer is something which is highly recommended and rewardable. Okay, so you've made wudu for the first prayer of the day. You came to the second prayer of the day, you're still in a state of wudu. You're still in a state of purity. But again, you want to go ahead and refresh your, your wudu. This is something which is highly recommended. And Ali radiallahu anhu in this narration, he says the way to do it if you want to, is that you do not have to wash your body parts, you just wipe them with water. That will suffice you, okay? Rather than washing them, you wipe them with water. And this is what the Prophet sallallahu did. But this is for tajdeed al-wudu. For the refreshing of the wudu, okay? For the one who didn't break the wudu. Tayyib. If you have, um, if you have anything like the females uh, sometimes, alhamdulillah, no strange males here. If you have any extensions on your, um, what they call nail extensions, right? That has to be removed for the women. Because that means that the water is not reaching underneath the original nails where it should reach okay if they've got some type of nail extension on them that has to be removed and anything similar to that the imam he says so the first obligation and we said it's a condition is the niya the second of them is to wash once each body part once the imam he says ma khala al kafain except for the two hands meaning you wash each body part once except for the two hands why do you think he says except for the two hands if you've woken up from the night's sleep, at this point, it's obligatory for you to wash your hands three times before you go ahead and touch the water that you are going to make wudu with. Okay? But in any other case, then it's one time. But if you've woken up from night's sleep, before you put your hand into a vessel of water, you have to wash your hands three times based upon other ahadith that we took and we discussed. And the Imam, he says, وَمَسُّ ras kullihi," And to wipe all of the head when you're making wudu. To wipe what? All of the head. Why did he mention and specify the whole of the head? We said because there are some ulama, like Imam Shafi, may Allah have mercy upon them, that said it suffices you to wipe just part of the head. And they based this upon some uh, technical definitions which we gave last time. I won't repeat them. But the correct opinion is that you have to wipe the whole of your head, okay? So the Imam, to stress his opinion, which is different to that, other opinion he says you have to wipe the whole of your head and this is the correct opinion inshallah ta'ala and then imam he says and the next of them the obligatory actions is tartib tartib means to do things in order that the wudu must be done in order why because this is how the prophet sallallahu always did the wudu in order he never broke the order and also in the quran in the verse of wudu allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says إِذَا قُمْتُمْ if you stand up from the prayer, talking about wudu now, wash your faces and your hands until your elbows, okay? And wipe your heads. And wash your feet up into the ankles. Did you notice something here? He said, wash your faces and wash your hands up into your elbows. Then wipe your heads and then wash your feet up into your ankles. Did you notice something? Good, so I mentioned wash, wash, wipe, wash. This in the language of the Arabs is not the norm. The Arabic language, they will talk about one matter first and then move on to the next matter. 
So it should have been the three washes first and then the one wiping. But Allah put the wiping in that place to show us that the order is important. Had the order not been important, Allah would have spoken about the washing first, which is the norm of the Arabs, and then he would have went on to the wiping. So the verse itself is a proof that order is also an obligatory part that needs to be um, done. And also the actions of the Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, is that he never broke the order of the Prophet this the imam he says and that you do not delay the washing of a part so much so that the part that you washed before now becomes dry you do not delay the washing of the next limb so much so that the one you just washed becomes dry this is known as muwalat okay muwalat so if i've washed my right arm okay and now i need to wash my left arm if for whatever reason a phone call comes my fiance to be, I start talking to her, romancing, going on and on and on. I forget that I'm making wudu. My right arm dries. I'm not now allowed to go and wash my left arm because I've broken that part of the wudu. The wudu has been broken, okay? So if the rest of my body has now dried, then I have to start my wudu from scratch. Otherwise, I can go to the part that was before the one that dried. In any case, the Imam is telling us that muwalat, which means continuity in the act of worship, has to be there. Okay, you cannot do one body part and then the other body part uh, dries before you get to the next. Unless it's an extremely hot day or less, unless something takes place like the water tanker breaks and you have to go and look for water. In that case, scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah, they said that because there was no tafrit, tafrit means there was no negligence, there was no laziness on your part, you can go ahead and carry on your wudu. Okay? <clears throat> what do you do? If somebody forgets to wash a body part, which is from the obligatory body parts of the wudu, just a side point. What you do is you go back to the body part before it, okay? So if you forgot to wash a body part and you're in the middle of wudu, you go back to the body part that was washed correctly before it and you continue the wudu from there, inshallah. So this is pertaining to the obligatory actions, okay? These are pertaining to the obligatory actions in the wudu, the wajibat. Now the Imam, he's going to talk about the Masnoon actions. Masnoon, the Sunan actions. That which is Mustahab. Okay, that which if you do it, you are rewarded for it. If you do not do it, there is no threat of punishment or anger of Allah upon you. There's nothing upon you. Sunnah is something which is highly recommended. You should do it, okay, because you love your Prophet ﷺ, you want to follow his way. But if you left it off, there's nothing whatsoever upon you in terms of sin. All you've done is that you've lost an amount of reward, which of course nobody would think is normal to do. So the first thing he mentions is the tasmiyah. The tasmiyah. The tasmiyah is to say bismillah. Okay, so there's two words we normally come across when we talk about bismillah. One is tasmiyah, which is bismillah. One is basmala, which is bismillah rahman rahim So the scholars, they differentiate. Tasmiyah generally you do in most of the acts of worship, okay? Uh, you just say Bismillah and it's like a dhikr but the Basmala which is Bismillah Rahman Rahim this is when you recite the Quran it's part of the Quran so what's the point of knowing these two things well the woman or the person the woman who has menstruation or the person is in a state of Janaba he can say the Tasmiyah he can say Bismillah without being in a state of purity but Bismillah Rahman Rahim according to the majority those, those two categories of people they cannot say so okay so in any case the Imam he says that the Tasmiyah which is Bismillah this is Sunnah for us to say when we make the Wudu right and we said that this is the opinion of the majority of the ulama but other scholars and we mentioned from them many of the Hanbali scholars they said that no it's obligatory because the Prophet Sallallahu said in the Hadith لا صلاة لمن لا وضوء له there's no prayer for the one who doesn't have Wudu and there's no wudu for the one who doesn't mention the name of Allah Azza wa Jal upon his wudu. In any case, we go by what our Imam says, okay? So not to be confused. The extra information is there for you to benefit. And then the next sunnah is the washing of the hands. What does he mean here? The washing of the hands. Sometimes we get confused. What he means is when you start to make wudu, okay? The first washing of the hands is sunnah. The obligatory washing of the hands is the one that you're going to do when you have to wash your arm completely. 
that's when it's an obligation. The first washing of your hands, which is before the mud mada and the washing of the face, that's sunnah. If you left that off, it's okay. The obligatory washing is the one which comes after, when you have to wash from your hands up into your elbows, okay? Before you wipe your head. And then the Imam, he says, And that you stress more, or that you um, exaggerate, when you make your mother mother and your istinshaq. Mad mother, the washing of the mouth and the washing of the nose. You make an exaggeration in the amount of water that you take and in the amount of efforts you make. So the mad mother, you swish the water around in your mouth. The istinshaq, you take the water up as if you're doing cocaine. You sniff it up, right? Uh, some of you woke up there. You sniff it up into your nose, right? That's how much it has to be done. Unless you are fasting, because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith narrated by Luqit ibn Subra, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Asbiqul wudu wa khalil bayn al asabe wa balik fil istinshaq illa an tukun saima." The Prophet ﷺ said, "Perfect your wudu and um, wash between the fingers and make exaggeration in the istinshaq, which is taking the water into your nose, unless you are fasting. Why, unless you are fasting, should you not do that?" Because it will go down through your nose, into your throat, and into your stomach, and that will break your fast, okay? So you do this exaggeration unless you're in a state of fasting. And the hadith I just mentioned was in Abi Dawood and Tirmidhi. The Imam now says, another sunnah, wa taqlilu lahya wal asabi'ah. And to make taqlil of the bed, which is to rub it like so, is a sunnah. And the asabi'ah, and to rub your fingers, also is a sunnah. Now the fingers of the hands are rubbed like this, okay? In between the fingers of the hands are rubbed like this. But how do you rub the fingers of the foot, the toes of the foot? With your, your, with your pinky, somebody said. Yeah, I haven't heard that for a long time. With your pinky, exactly. There's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu is narrated in Abi Dawood that Al-Mastawrid Ibn Shaddad, he said, رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى إِذَا كَانَ بِخِنْصَرِهِ the Prophet ﷺ is narrated by Al Mustawrid ibn Shaddad in Abi Dawood that the Prophet ﷺ, when he would make wudu, he would rub his uh, toes with his little finger, with his pinky. Okay? And now the Imam he says, And to wipe the ears is also a sunnah. To wipe the ears is also a sunnah. But we said that there are a group of ulama from the Hanbali madhab, may Allah have mercy upon them and others, who said that it's obligatory. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in that authentic hadith, al udhanani min al ras that the, the ears are from the head, they're a part of the head. So you wipe the head, you also wipe the ears as an obligation. That's an opinion. But the opinion of the Imam and the majority, they say that it's sunnah. Okay, it's sunnah. Taib, if you are going to wipe your ears, which you should be doing, how do you do it? This finger, is this index finger, right? The index finger is in the inside and the thumb is on the outside. So you wipe like so, okay? Now, does it suffice you to have the same water that you had from the head, the wiping of the head, or do you have to take new water? Okay? Imam Ibn Qudam, the author of this book, in his encyclopedia of fiqh, known as Al-Mughni, he mentioned that it's better, khuruj al min al-khilaf, to come out of the dif difference of opinion, because there's a difference that says you should, there's a difference that says you shouldn't. He said to come out khurujan min al-khilaf, difference of opinion, he said it's better for you to do it because it is authentically narrated that the Prophet ﷺ did so. Okay, and nobody's going to really tell you off, even those who hold the opinion that you shouldn't, they're not going to scream and shout that you are doing something which is contrary to the uh, act of worship of wudu. So to avoid the difference of opinion, it's better for you to do so, according to the Imam. The Imam, he now says also from Sunnah, is ghasul, ghasul mayamin qabl al-mayasir, is to wash the right, before the left. This is what? What's the ruling? Sunnah. So if somebody asks you, they say to you, I was, my wife gave me a huge shopping list. I got so confused, it made me dizzy. At Salah time, I was still thinking about the shopping list. I did my left before my right. What's the ruling of my uh, wudu? You tell him, it's okay. Because the Imam, he says, the right before the left. And also, to do the right is something, as we know, is recommended. Because Aisha, our mother, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, she said, كَانَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ يُعْجِبُهُ أَتَّيَامُنُ فِي تَنَعُلِهِ وَتَرُجُّلِهِ وَفِي تُهُورِهِ وَفِي شَعْنِهِ كُلِّهِ The Prophet ﷺ used to love uh, using his right uh, when he would make purification or combing his hair or putting on his shoes or all of his affairs. He would love to start with the right. So this is a recommended sunnah. But if you do not do so, 
due to some confusion or you forgot, then it doesn't affect your wudu in any uh, way whatsoever, inshallah. The Imam, he says, وَغَصْلُ ثَلَاثًا ثَلَاثًا And to do your wudu three times. We already spoke about this. وَتُكْرَهُ أَزْيَادَةُ عَلَيْهَا And it's makru, it's disliked to do more than three times. In fact, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Rajihi, one of the explainers of the book, Rahimullah, Hafidahullah, he said that it's kiraha uh, shadid. It's severely disliked to do more than that. Okay, to do more than three is severely disliked. Why? Because in the hadith of Abi Dawood, Amr ibn Shu'aib, he narrates that a uh, Bedouin came to the Prophet وسلم, and asked the Prophet وسلم, how to make wudu. فَأَرَاهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَوْضُوَ ثَلَاثٌ ثَلَاثٌ فَقَالَ حَكَدَ الْوَدُو فَمَنْ زَادَ عَلَى هَذَا فَقَدْ أَسَاءَ وَتَعَدَّ وَظَلَمَ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم showed this Bedouin Arab how to make wudu three times, each body part three times, and he said whoever does above this and beyond this, then verily he has transgressed and he has done something which is very wrong. He has transgressed on something which is wrong and he has oppressed himself. He's done oppression. Okay, so many of the ulama, they say, in fact, it's haram. Don't go beyond three. Our imam, he's saying it's makru. It's something which is severely disliked. Okay? And then the imam, he says, wal israfu fil ma, And to have israf in water. What does the word israf mean? Extravagance, right? Extravagance in water. Wastefulness in water. To have wastefulness in water is something which is severely disliked. Okay? But subhanallah, look at the state of many of the Muslims when they go to make wudu. The taps are open, flowing. This is, you're wasting the, the resources of humanity. Something which in so many parts of the world is scarce. You have to realize the blessing that Allah has given us. In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said this, uh, he was asked about it. He said, even if you're on the bank of a river and you have all that water in front of you, even in that situation, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to waste the resource. And the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of uh, Abdullah uh, there's a hadith collected by Imam Ahmad in, uh, narrated by Abdullah ibn Mughaffal that he saw one of his sons or he heard one of his sons making dua. يقول, his son was saying, one of the companions heard his son saying, oh, oh Allah, I ask you for a white palace on the right hand side of Jannah when I enter it. So his father said to him, Ay Bunay, just ask Allah for Jannah and seek refuge from the hellfire. That there would be people in my nation that will come, they go beyond the bounds in making purification and in making dua. Yani they go beyond the bounds in making purification, they use too much water and they go beyond the limits. And in making dua, they give too many details, keep it simple. The words of the Prophet ﷺ in dua will be very comprehensive and simple. طيب, that we finish. So we said that to use uh, water extravagantly is something which is severely disliked. And to use it in the situation of its, if it's the water of the awqaf, for example, the water in these masajid, the ruling is different. It's not now uh, makru, it's haram. Why is it haram? Because it's not your water. The water was put in these masajid, giving you permission to use it for a specific uh, objective. Now, if you go beyond that objective, you've done something which is forbidden because it's not your water to be used in that manner. طيب. One more thing to add with regards to this chapter before we move on about wudu. The Prophet وسلم, as mentioned by Uthman radiallahu anhu in the hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet وسلم, said, Man ثم صلى رقعتين لم يحدث فيهما نفسه غفر لهما تقدم من ذنبه. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, whoever makes wudu like my wudu, as explained in the hadith of Uthman in Bukhari, and then he prays two units of prayer, and he doesn't speak to himself in that unit of prayer. Meaning he doesn't start thinking about the wife shopping list and all other thoughts. He's just concentrating on the prayer. Okay. Then for this person, after making the wudu and doing those two units of prayer, all his minor sins will have been forgiven. Such an easy act, but very few people do it. You make wudu and you make two units of prayer, all of your minor sins are forgiven by the permission of Allah جل, as long as you were concentrating in that act of worship. طيب, we still have 10 minutes, so we'll continue with the chapter of siwak. The Imam, he moves on after wudu and he says, Babu siwak. Siwak is that which you use to clean your teeth with, okay? Now many of the ulama, they said it has to be done by that which is twig from particular trees, right? 
uh, oud, okay? That which is a twig from particular uh, trees, or any tree, in fact, a twig, okay? Used to clean your teeth. Other ulama, they say that if you cannot find that, then you can do it with any other hard object, okay? And in fact, some of them, like Sheikh Uthaymin, rahimullah ta'ala, he said, as in Zad al-Mustaqni, his explanation, he said, even if you can't find that, like a toothbrush or the actual siwak itself, use your finger. Because the rule in fiqh is, ما لا يدرك كله لا يترك جله ما لا يدرك كله لا يترك جله That which you cannot achieve in totality, you should not leave in totality. So that act of worship of siwak, we cannot achieve it in its totality because we don't have this work. That doesn't mean that you leave it now in totality. You do the next best thing, which is the use of the finger, okay? Or anything of that nature. So we're talking about the siwak, babu siwak. The Prophet وسلم, as narrated by Imam Ahmad and Imam Nisa'i, he, he said, siwak rab. That the siwak is purifying for the mouth and it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this small act of worship is purifying for the mouth and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imam, he says, وَيَسُنُّ أَسِيْوَاكَ إِنْ تَغَيِّرُ الْفَمْ And the siwak, it's recommended to do when the mouth changes. What does he mean by the mouth changes? So he means the smell of the breath changes. That's what he means, okay? So if there's a change in the smell of the breath, in that situation, then it's highly recommended for you to make siwak because if you don't, your wife will faint, okay? Keep your breath nice, keep your breath fresh, and this is a good uh, adab that we should have for ourselves, especially when worshipping Allah, and especially for our poor wives and companions that are around us. Try to keep your breath as, as clean as possible, especially coming to the masjid, as we will mention. That the Prophet Sallallahu he said, وَإِنْ دَقِيَامْ مِنَ النَّوْمْ For example, the Imam, he says, uh, getting up from the night. Why he mentions it here, getting up from the night, as important, because the righteous, they get up from the night to worship Allah Azawajal. As in the hadith in Bukhari, Hudayfa radiyallahu anhu, he said, كَانَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم إِذَا قَامَ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ يَشُوْ صُفَاهُ بِالسَّوَاكِ That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would get up from the night to worship Allah, he would use the siwak to clean his mouth. Okay? Because now he's about to do what? He's about to have that quality time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's another authentic hadith. I can't remember the exact place. I think it's by Imam Al-Bazar. He collects the hadith where he said that when the person gets up in the night prayer to pray, then the angel comes behind him listening to the Quran. And as he's reciting the Quran in the prayer, the angel gets closer and closer to him such that the angel puts his mouth upon the mouth of the worshiper and takes the Quran from him in that manner. Because the act of worship is so magnificent. So an angel is sent to him to observe and to partake in the act of worship. So cleaning the uh, mouth in that time is something which is highly recommended. And he says, in the salah liqawli Rasulullah This is the point I wanted to get to. And also, when you stand up from the prayer, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Laula anna shuqa ala ummati la amartuhum bi siwak in the kulli salah." Had it not been difficult for my nation, I would have made it obligatory, meaning a must that when you get up for the prayer, you have to use the siwak. How many times we come to the masjid, we want to concentrate, we want to enjoy the recitation, like the recitation of this blessed Imam who led us in the prayer, such beautiful voice. But sometimes you've got somebody next to you who's eaten garlic, who's eaten raw onions or something of that nature, and the mouth, is the, the smell is so strong, it puts you off the salah. Okay? So keeping yourself, your mouth pure when coming to the masjid is something which is highly recommended. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you eat raw garlic, and leek and raw onion, then stay away from the masjid. Imagine, the Prophet is telling you to stay away from the masjid. All right, if you have something which is going to disturb the worshippers. Because he said that which disturbs the worshippers disturbs also the angels. So you're not allowed to come in a smelling state. But of course, don't say now, okay, the workers who clean the streets, when they come, they smell. This is a different situation. Allah has tested them with having that hard and difficult job. Okay, we have to overlook them because they have a different situation. But those of us who are gifted with uh, luxury, we can change our clothes, we can put the perfumes on, the deodorants, clean our mouths, we should do all of this. So the Imam, he said, that use the siwak when you pray. Also the Imam, he said, or the scholars, they say, at the time of wudu. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said the same hadith, لَوْ لَا أَنَا شُكَّ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي لَا أَمَرْتُهُمْ بِسِوَاكْ مَعَ كُلِّ wudu. I would have ordered them, had it not been difficult, to do siwak with every wudu. Okay, with every wudu. Which hand, which side of the mouth do you start the siwak from? Salah love to start with the right, okay? Which hand do you use when you make the siwak? The right, huh? No. 
Many of the ulama, especially the Hanbali scholars, they said the left. Why? Because izalatul adha, removing that which is harmful and cleanliness in general, when you go to the bathroom, etc., you use the left hand and say this is part of cleanliness. So you use the left hand when you're doing the siwak. Start from the right, but use the left hand when you're doing the siwak. When you're making the wudu, which part of the wudu should you do the siwak? Beginning, middle, end, or all of them? Which part of the wudu? Which part do you think? End. Huh? Beginning. Nobody said middle. <laughs> Actually, middle is closer, right? Because the madmada, what's the madmada? It's the washing of the mouth, isn't it? When you're, when you're washing your mouth. And that's the time when it's munasib. It's appropriate then to use the miswak because it helps the cleanliness of the mouth. So when you're doing the madmada, the washing, washing of the mouth, that's when, according to many of the scholars, as mentioned in Zad al Mustaqni and other places, that you should do it at that point, okay? And the Imam says, well, يُسْتَحَبُّ فِي سَائِرِ الْأَوْقَاتِ And it's recommended, apart from these times that he's mentioned, to do in all other times, like you come upon your family, uh, you mix with people in a gathering, it's recommended to keep your mouth fresh uh, in that way. إِلَّا لِصَائِمْ بَعْدَ zawal. And he said, except for the one who is fasting after zawal, after the, the noon, noon time. He said, except for the one after zawal. If you're fasting and you have reached the time of noon, then don't use the miswak. Why? Why do you think? Exactly, the smell of the fasting person, right? Which is disliked to the creation but love to Allah. Because in the hadith it said, In Bukhari, that the, the smell of the one of you which emanates from you when you are fasting is more beloved to Allah than the smell of the best of perfumes. Okay, so the creation may frown upon it, but to Allah it's beloved. Why? Because you're doing it for his sake, right? So our imam and others, they said, when it reaches uh, the, the noon time, you shouldn't remove that smell. Like when you bury the martyr and he has blood over him. You shouldn't wash off that blood. Why? Because it's something which is beloved to Allah. Because it's such a high act of worship. So they say likewise for the one who's fasting, you shouldn't remove the smell. Okay? But other scholars, they say no, actually, the smell, no matter how much you do the miswak, is not going to be removed. Because it's emanating from the emptiness of the stomach. In any case, Allah knows best. Tayyip? By that, we reach the end of what I wanted to say today on these points, inshallah. Anything which was correct was for a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mistakes and shortcomings were from myself, myself and shaitan. Uh, we ask Allah azawajal that he makes this small deed heavy in our scales on the day of judgment. If you have any questions or clarifications, then feel free, inshallah.